Hello, I'm Lynn Jarvis, contributing editor for Across the Fence, and today we begin a journey that will take me to my seventh continent, Antarctica. We're at JFK Airport, waiting to board land flight 530, that in 15 hours from takeoff will deliver us in Punta Arenas, Chile. Traveling with me is Barbara Baker from Marlboro, New York, who will keep a journal to help write the script, and our Spanish-speaking friend Marco Ayala, who will help us communicate down there, and on our return, we'll edit the video into the show you are now watching. Let the adventure begin! Eleven hours from New York City, we were elated to exit the plane in Santiago for our connecting flight to Punta Arenas. For reasons never fully explained, our luggage didn't make it to Santiago, and with the complications, we missed two flights trying to find it. We didn't leave Santiago until 7 p.m., now some six hours behind schedule stretching our 15-hour journey to 21. Upon arrival in Punta Arenas, things didn't seem quite right. People were somber, restaurants were closed, and there were no cars, taxis, or buses to be seen. Weird, we thought. We've just arrived at the Punta Arenas Airport and we're caught in one of those traveler's nightmares. It seems like the airport has been closed down by some strikers who are protesting an increase in propane gas prices. Everything's shut down, they've blocked the road, so it looks like we're going to stay here for the night. And that's just what happened along with many other weary travelers who are in the same predicament. As the night dragged on, we learned that the Chilean government ordered natural gas prices to be raised by 18%. The locals were caught by surprise and quickly organized a peaceful protest and, in solidarity, they closed their stores and halted transportation, both land and sea, shutting down Punta Arenas. This part of Chile is cold year-round, and so large an increase would create financial hardship for many. And the straw that broke the camel's back, most of the country's natural gas is mined right here in the Punta Arenas area. Feeling trapped, I managed to call the U.S. Embassy in Santiago and was told representatives were on their way. As promised, Lee and Victoria arrived and established a crisis center. They proposed three options, go home, wait for the strike to end, or walk to town. All morning, rumors spread about a bus that would come to our rescue and we waited outside the airport. 12.30 p.m. arrived and no bus. With the prospect of spending another horrendous night at the airport, we decided to start the 15-mile walk to town. Whoever invented suitcases with wheels, bless you. It was a beautiful day for a walk and what an amazing sight to see so many people, young and old, making their way along the road that stretched as far as the eye could see. Tractors and trailer trucks were used to establish five barricades along the road. With apprehension, we approached the first one. No problems, we just walked through and continued on our way. There in the distance was our destination, Punta Arenas. Would we ever make it? Just then our luck began to turn. The first of two locals stopped to give us rides. They could not cross the barricades, but their help cut our walking time in half. After the last barricade, another good Samaritan rescued us with a ride to our hotel, Rey Don Felipe. What a relief. After a quick dinner, we slept long and sound after 36 hours of sleep deprivation. Well, obviously things didn't go quite as planned. After two missed plane connections, a lost suitcase, and I'm having to loan Marco clothes that are twice too big for him, an overnight at the airport in that long walk. We are finally here in Punta Arenas, located on the Strait of Magellan, named for the 16th century Portuguese explorer Ferdinand Magellan. Translated, Punta Arenas means sandy point and is the jumping off place for our Antarctic expedition. But first, let's explore this city of some 150,000 people. The harbor on Brunswick Peninsula, although rough much of the time, was considered one of Chile's most important ports until 1914 when the Panama Canal was completed. 
Today it is mostly used by tour ships and scientific expeditions. There in the distance is Tierra del Fuego that we would visit later on our journey. After some difficult years, the economy of the area now has considerable diversity and the city is vibrant and modern. Chile's principal oil and natural gas reserves are located in those mountains along with some low-grade coal. Agriculture, fishing, and most importantly, tourism have contributed to its popularity and steady growth. Our wanderings brought us to Plaza de Armas and this impressive bronze statue of Magellan, dedicated on December 16, 1920 to celebrate the 400th anniversary of his discovery of the strait named in his honor. Why all that noise? Because the strike is gaining momentum and hundreds of people have taken to the streets to protest the hike in the price of natural gas. The demonstrations were peaceful and we could come and go as we pleased. Really, it was quite exciting as it was the first demonstration we had ever been a part of. Our sympathies were with the people. The rally was close to the park, so we didn't have far to go for shopping. We enjoyed meeting the vendors and purchasing some of their lovely hand-knitted hats and scarves. Being in penguin country, many of their items featured them in all shapes and sizes. Several varieties of stuffed penguins were available, with their happy faces on shirts, hats, vests, sweaters, and scarves. Unlike other countries, there was no pressure to purchase, and with a dozen booths, we enjoyed taking our time to find exactly what we wanted. After our two days in Punta Arenas, we were rested and excited to meet some of our fellow travelers at an evening briefing led by Pascal Tacoen, our tour host. We would be leaving early the next morning to catch our plane to Antarctica. She went on to tell us to wear our heaviest clothes for the morning departure. So you get the trousers over the boots, okay? And then, so it depends how many layers you want. Onion style, one, two layers, uh, fleece. Puede vestirse como diferentes capas según lo frío que tiene. Aquí el pantalón arriba de las botas. So, like this. Since the strike was still on, if asked where we were going, we were to say, back to Santiago. That left us a bit apprehensive, and as it turned out, we had every right to be. Morning arrived, and by bus, we were taken to an isolated beach where we boarded a small pilot boat. The sea was rough, and it was pouring rain. Grasping a railing for dear life, we climbed aboard and were happy we had all made it safely inside. We soon learned that Pascal was a tough French lady. Another part of her job was helping get all of our luggage aboard. Despite the ordeal, our oldest traveler, 76-year-old Francesco Cirignoni from Milan, Italy, kept a smile on his face as the boat rocked and rolled. None of us were prepared for a water approach to the airport and it wasn't long until most of us were seasick. Heads down and eyes shut, we were told. The hour aboard the small boat finally passed and, with Pascal's help who was barefoot in the cold water, we jumped the waves to shore. Then all the luggage was brought to the bus that eventually came to bring us to the airport. Wet and cold, it was a relief to be on firm ground. Three cheers to the Antarctica 21 crew for getting us through yet another unplanned adventure. Our two-hour flight took us to King George Island, part of the Antarctic Peninsula on the Fildes Peninsula. The rain had stopped, but it was still very windy. After all we had been through, we were elated. Everyone documented the arrival with photos and video. After the celebration, it was a half-mile walk past Frey Station to reach shore. The research station is an important Antarctic base for Chile and with its short airstrip serves as the only means of transport for other nearby bases from China, Korea, and Poland. From Frey Station, we got our first look at the Ocean Nova. 
our home for the next six days, it looked very small in the howling winds of the Antarctic Ocean. Built in Denmark in 1922, with an ice-strengthened hull to sail the ice-clad waters of Greenland, we were told that it was a sturdy and safe vessel for our upcoming expedition. It had better be, we thought, as we waited in the harsh wind to board zodiacs that would transport us to the ocean Nova. For your information, the government backed off on raising the price of natural gas and, ironically, the strike ended about the time we boarded the Ocean Nova. A journey is a person itself, no two are alike and all plans, safeguards, and policies are fruitless. We find after years of struggle that we do not take a trip, a trip takes us. John Steinbeck. We are at the end of the world, as close to heaven as the living can be. Feeling the spirit of many brave souls who perished here, fighting against the relentless forces of nature in the spirit of humanity. Carolyn Mickelson, first woman to reach Antarctic continent. Glittering white, shining blue, raven black in the light of the sun, the land looks like a fairy tale. Pinnacle and peak, crevasse, Wild as any land on our globe, it lies unseen and untrodden. Ronald Amundsen, first man to reach South Pole. Fossils of ferns and palm-like trees found beneath the ice here, in the Punta Arenas area, and in Tasmania, show evidence of continental drift, and it's quite possible that millions of years ago, these regions may have been joined together, creating a supercontinent known as Gondwala Land. The Antarctic has, by far, the coldest climate on our planet due to two factors in geological history. One is its drift towards the South Pole, and the other is the opening of a channel between South America and the Antarctic Peninsula, now known as the Drake Passage, with its powerful currents that block the warm Pacific and Atlantic waters from reaching this far down. Mean temperatures in the interior during August, the coldest month, range from minus 40 to minus 70 degrees, but here on the peninsula they average a balmy minus 5 degrees. Antarctica is the driest continent on Earth with two inches of accumulated water a year and is the world's driest desert since the extreme cold freezes water vapor out of the air. Even here on the peninsula, we were aware of this phenomena as our skin became dry and some experienced nosebleeds. Ice covers 99.6% of the continent and its ice sheets contain 70% of the world's fresh water. The sea around Antarctica freezes every winter forming a layer of ice 3 to 10 feet thick and extending up to 120 miles offshore. This is called fast ice. As temperatures moderate in summer, fast ice breaks apart and forms ice flows that are moved around by currents until they pile up and cover large areas called pack ice. Icebergs, however, are simply pieces of ice of all sizes which have broken off ice sheets or glaciers and float in the sea. Two-thirds of their volume is usually below the water making them particularly dangerous for ocean navigation. This iceberg has a natural arch, but not safe for us to pass through. Along with its remoteness and spectacular scenery, it's the penguins that draw visitors here. They are flightless and wobble over the slippery rocks and snow using their wings for balance. In water, however, they are like torpedoes and swim through the cold water with great joy. Many varieties of seals survive here like the Weddell. They are the largest and fattest and can live the furthest south of any other mammal. 
On Dalman Bay, we saw more whale tails than we could count. At least a dozen humpback were feeding on krill, a close relative of the shrimp, and these huge creatures can consume up to a ton a day. If you have enjoyed what you've seen today, join us tomorrow when our adventure in the coldest and most remote part of the world continues right here on Across the Fence. In Antarctica, I'm Lynn Jarvis on beautiful Paradise Bay, and thank you for watching.